All right, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to lecture this morning. Happy Wednesday to you. Uh, two quick announcements. I hope you just saw my email. Um, good news, the homeworks are all posted for the rest of the semester, so you can have a little bit more advanced warning there on when things are due. That's great. Um, if you clicked on the homework five, which is due next week, by the way, if you clicked on that in Carmen, um, what popped up was a document that was titled homework three and had the wrong dates on it. So uh, that, is, that is homework five. I think the problems are correct. That's the, it's the right chapters that we're working on here. Um, but it should be homework five, and it's due next week. So I think that's uh, October uh, 17, maybe, something like that. So just watch out for that. Uh, also, exam one grades should all be posted now. I uh, hope you had access to those. And those will be handed back to you in your recitation section tomorrow. Um, so your TA, your TA has all those, and we'll be, we'll be giving those back to you guys tomorrow. Any, uh, any questions before we jump in this morning about exam stuff or homeworks or anything like that? All right, well, we're going to pick up our discussion where we left off on, chap uh, on Friday with Chapter 11 here in Sampling Distributions. And just to refresh you, a few things of what we're, what we're discussing in this chapter now, kind of some definitions that we need. Again, kind of thinking back to Chapter 8 when we were talking about sampling methods, remember this distinction between our population and our sample. So the population is the larger group of interests that we're trying to make a statement about. We don't actually get information from everybody in our population. Um, instead, we take a sample, we take a, a subset of that population and actually collect information from those people. So just remember our, our, our distinction here between these two groups. Um, and then sort of corresponding to those two groups, we have uh, two numerical quantities. One of them is a parameter, uh, which is just describes something about the population, so the, the average debt or the proportion of people who agree with something or, or something about the larger population. That's a number. And that's, that's something we don't know because we, we don't talk to everybody in our population. Um, and then we have sort of corresponding to that is a, what's called a, a statistic. So that's what this class is about. Um, formal definition of a statistic is something that we can compute from our, from our sample. So if I uh, take a sample of you guys in here and um, I can compute your average height or I can compute the proportion of you who are um, freshmen or, or any, anything like that. So um, the statistic is what I actually calculate from, from my sample. And that leads us to the idea of, of two different things here. We had, we had uh, again, corresponding to these two groups, we have the population distribution. Um, so suppose I'm interested, again, in, uh, in the, the debt after graduation for Ohio State students. Uh, the population distribution would actually include all of those individual values. So whatever a person's debt was after college, would, we would put that number in here. On the other hand, we have what's called a, a sampling distribution, which is um, again, for, if I'm interested in calculating the average debt from all my samples, um, the, the sampling distribution is the distribution that that sample average would take over all possible samples. And so then we looked at, uh, we looked at this example here where um, suppose I'm in this sort of artificial case where um, these 400 students are my population. So here my population is not that big. Um, so for each one of these 400 people, I have calculated, or I've, I've asked them what, the, I've, I've taken, they're in my sample, and I've asked them what their height is. So for each of these 400 people, I find what their height is, and I make a, I make a histogram of their, of their heights. So this is what we looked at right at the end on Friday. So keeping that histogram in mind, I'll, I'll put it back up here in a second. Uh, now suppose from those 400 people, um, suppose I can, I can take a bunch of simple random samples. So I can take... Um, 1,000 maybe simple random samples of size of size five from from this group from this group of 400 people. So from my from my subjects from my data over here, I take I take some some random samples here in the middle. Uh, my first sample has those five heights there, and I can calculate an average from that from that sample. My second sample has those uh, another five numbers in there. That's another five people in my sample. I can calculate an average there, and I can do that a whole bunch of times. And then what I can do is um, take this column right here, take all the averages, and make it make a histogram of them. So in the first, in the previous picture, I had the individual heights were, were in that histogram, and now 
I've taken a bunch of, of samples, found averages from each one of those samples, and made a histogram. And so we can compare, we can compare these two things. So the first one pointing out was, was the population distribution. This one had um, That had my 400 individuals had all of their their heights were, were in that in that distribution, and over here on the second one I have uh, this is uh, sample averages or sample mean um, from the 1,000 simple random samples. So uh, so again, this, what I mean by sampling distribution is the distribution of the sample average that I can get from from my population. So where was a so so again, uh, here's here's the distinction. Maybe this picture, hopefully this picture helps you see what I'm talking about here. Um, and I, th I think Sarah made the observation at the end that we have something something very something very clear going on here. What 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 do you notice that's different about these two these two histograms? The shape, the shape right? The shape is extremely different. So over here in my population distribution, I have this kind of a bimodal thing going on, and then over here in my sampling distribution, I have something a little bit more like that. Um, so the shape so the shape changes and that's that's something that we will capitalize on later later in this chapter actually. So a any question you guys can think of on on what uh, what we're talking about here what population distribution versus sampling distribution or any, any of these definitions? Okay. So let's uh, let's let's push on here, keeping keeping these these things in mind. So so kind of stepping back now and saying, in general, um, again, we're going to be using we're going to be using x bar to estimate. We're going to be using the sample mean to estimate the population mean, but we need to figure out how how we can do that in a good way. Um, so some more general properties here for us is that if if x bar is the mean of a simple random sample of a of size n drawn from a large population that has mean mu and standard deviation sigma, um, then the sampling distribution of uh, should be an x bar in here of x bar has mean mu and standard deviation sigma uh, sigma divided by the square root of n. So, so we can think about if um, if x if x i if one of our if, if our well, sorry, let me change that. So if if x has um, has mean mu and standard deviation sigma, uh, x bar will have mean sigma over square root of n. So the sample average will have the same mean that the original variable does, um, but a slightly different standard deviation. That's all, that's all that this is saying here. <coughs> and that's, this, this, is all, this is always true, regardless of what, what uh, variable that we're looking at, looking at here. So this, this we, can, we can pull a few things out of this. Um, just like, just like uh, well, so, so as we mentioned before, x bar is going to be an unbiased estimator of, of mu because the, the average of x bar, the mean of x bar is going to, be, going to be that mu that we're looking for. And then our standard deviation changes, right? Before it was sigma, now it's sigma over the square root of n, which again tells us that um, averages are less, have less variability than, than just, a regular, just an individual observation. And so that goes back to what, we guys, what you guys did in... Uh, in recitation for chapter eight with the um, random rectangles, again we found that that the class average, the average of averages, the average of everybody in the room, was going to be closer to the the true value because there were more more observations in there. Um, so this is kind of some some proof of that here. So as as your as your sample size n gets bigger, um, your standard deviation uh, of sigma over the square root of n will get will get smaller. So as you take more people, your your um, your estimate x bar is going to be less less variable, and then that's kind of kind of what I'm saying here. So because um, 
because that square root of n is, is in the denominator of sigma, then large samples are going to have less variability than, than small samples. So what, what now if, uh, what if the population distribution that we have is, is normal? We can kind of, again, go back to our, uh, what, we've, what we've done before in chapter, in chapter 3, um, and, and I guess also since then a little bit, and uh, in chapter 10, and, and think about what if our population distribution is normal? So what if that first, those two histograms I showed you, what if the one on the left, the population distribution was a normal distribution? Um, well, we can kind of use the same, the same thing that we've used before to answer the same kind of questions that we did before. What's the probability that the, um, or, or what, um, below what number is the, is the smallest 10% of the, of the variable or, or something like that. Um, so we're going to use, we're going to go back again to this idea of z-scores. And uh, here a general way to think about our z-score is, is, is this, this definition here. So remember it was z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. And we're thinking about the variable x has mean mu and standard deviation sigma. So that's, um, we're, taking, we're taking whatever value we're interested in, we're subtracting off its mean, and we're dividing by the standard deviation. That was our, that was our general, general formula for a z-score. And that tells us how many standard deviations we are away from the mean. Um, we, can, uh, we can do a, a similar thing here with our, if, if our population distribution is normal, if we have our, if we have our sample mean, we can um, find z-scores exactly the same way. So again, if the, if the individual observations have a normal distribution with, with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, um, then the sample mean x-bar is also going to have a normal distribution um, with the mean mu and standard deviation, what we just said, sigma over the square root of n. So again, if x is, is normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then your sample mean is also going to be normal with the same mean and standard deviation sigma over the square root of n. That's, that's, what, that's what this little slide, that's what this slide is saying. <clears throat> so now if I, if I want to think about z-scores for, uh, for a sample mean here, instead of taking the x minus mu over sigma, um, this, will be, this will be my new formula if I'm finding a z-score for a sample mean for, for an x-bar. So before, Remember, z was equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. And I was, I was working with x. And now we have an x bar in the value that we're looking at. And therefore, our, our denominator changes to be, to, be the, uh, to be the standard deviation of x bar. And again, just remember, this is equal to our value minus the mean divided by the appropriate The appropriate standard deviation, and now the appropriate standard deviation is the is the standard deviation of, of x bar. So it's going to be sigma over square root of n. And so once you have your z score, you're sort of back in the same boat that you were in back in chapter three. Uh, so we can do the, the that's why we hit it so hard there and have kept hitting it is that we're going to do it some more do it some more here in chapter eleven. Um, so any questions about what, I, what I've been saying up here? Any question you guys can think of? It's okay so far? All right. Then let's take a look at an example here, and we'll see, uh, see, what we, see how, these, how we can apply these concepts. So we're going to go back to our English Springer Spaniels that we looked at back in Chapter 3. Um, and what the example tells us is that the uh, the distribution of, of adult male English Springer Spaniels is approximately normal with mean 52.5 pounds and standard deviation 2.5 pounds. So now again we're sort of in this artificial situation where we uh, we're assuming what our what our mean is and standard deviation. So this is mu and this is this is sigma. 
kind of the, the same same setup that we've seen before. So now suppose that one springer is selected at random. What is the probability that the average weight is more than 54 pounds? <coughs> so again, I want to, uh, I can draw my picture here. So if I'm, if I'm just taking, if I'm just taking one, one springer spaniel, um, I'm kind of back in the chapter, chapter three situation, right? I'm not looking at an average of anything here. I just, I'm taking one, one English springer spaniel and, and, and talking about that. So what I want to know is the probability um, kind of throw this probability notation at you again. Um, well, first let me say that let's let x equal the weight of one English Springer Spaniel. So I want the probability that that weight x is, uh, is greater than 54 pounds. Is everybody okay with that notation? I just want the probability that x, that the weight of that one, one dog, is, is more than 54 pounds. So then I can, I can go back to the, the usual situation. I can draw my normal curve here, it's centered at the mean, which is 52.5. And then we can figure out what that corresponds to on the z scale, centered at 0. And I'm interested up here at 54. And then I, again, this is all old hat by now. I want to know probability of being greater than 54 so I can shade into the shade into the to the right there that's the number that I want to that's the number that I want to figure out so I'm still back in chapter 3 situation so we know we know how to do this so remember that my um, I need to find my Z which is equal to uh, X minus mu divided by Sigma which is 52.5 minus, sorry, that's not right. <laughs> 54 minus 52.5 divided by 2.5. That's going to be 0 0.60 if you calculate that out. And fill that in on our, on our chart there. And so then what I know, the probability that x is bigger than 54 is the same thing as the probability of z being greater than 0 0.60. And now I can go, now I can go to the, the table like I've always done before, right? So this is, this is 1 minus the probability that z is less than or equal to 0 0.60, or 1 minus 0.7257, which is 0.2743. So that this shaded in area now is equal to 0 My note, is the notation okay? I'm, I'm kind of throwing that new at you here. So I'm writing the probability that x is greater than 54. Uh, well, we know that the probability that x is greater than 54 is the same as saying probably that z is bigger than point, point 0.6. That's why I've made that equality there. And I'll start, I'll start doing that more, more regularly here. All right, so nothing, nothing new here yet. Let's um, move on to the second part of this equation, uh, this example. So now suppose that four springers are selected at random. What is the probability that the mean weight is more than 54 pounds? So looking at the same number, but now I'm taking, now I'm taking four springers. So now I am taking an average of, of these weights. Um, so let's let x bar equal the, the average weight of the four English Springer Spaniels, and I want to know the probability that that average weight is more than 54. So picture is going to look exactly the same over here. This is my X bar. Remember, it's still centered at 52.5, and I want to know something about what's this probability is greater than 54. 
So I can find the corresponding z-score down here, which is centered at zero. So what my z is going to be now is I'm going to use my new formula. I'm going to take x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. Um, just remember my, my standard deviation for the sample mean is different now. It's, it's now sigma divided by the square root of n. So same general formula. I'm taking whatever value I'm interested, subtracting off the mean, dividing by its standard deviation. It's just the standard deviation now is sigma over the square root of n. So here this is, uh, we're still interested in 54. The mean is the same. Standard deviation is 2.5 divided by the square root of 4. And if you calculate that out, you will get <clears throat> 1.5 divided by 1.25, or 1.20. So we can fill that in on our chart down here. The x bar of 54 corresponds to a z of uh, 1.2 now. So I can do the, now I can do the same thing that I did on the previous slide. I want the probability that x bar is greater than 54, which is the same as the probability of z being greater than 1.20, which is I want to I can subtract off the probability that it's less than that. And if you check uh, table A, so again I'm glossing over that step, but we will always we're always going back to table A to find out what these probabilities for our z variable are. Um, this is going to be 1 minus 0 0.8849, which is 0 0.1151. So the last step is essentially the same thing you guys have been doing for the entire course. <laughs> looking at the z-table to find out what that probability is. The difference now is how we're, how we're finding that z-score at the top. Everybody okay here with what's going on? Any questions you can think of? No good? Well, we're going to do this one, one more time. <laughs> so part, part C here, suppose now that we have 16 dogs that we take at random. Same question, what's probably that their mean is more than 54 pounds? So now let's let x bar on this slide equal the average weight of 16 English Springer Spaniels. And just for completeness, I'm going to draw the picture again, although it's the same, it's the same picture. I'm looking at the sample, the average of, of my sample here, it's still centered at the mean, which is 52.5. Still interested in something about 54. And now I can calculate the z-score just like I did on the, on the previous slide. So it's going to be x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. Still interested in 54, subtract off the mean, 52.5, um, divided by 2.5 over the square root of 16. So again, I'm looking at n, I'm looking at 16, 16 uh, English Springer Spaniels, which means my n will be equal to 16. n is always the number of things that I have in my sample. And again, what I want is this shaded in area over there to the right. Calculate this out. This will give you 2.40. All right, so same, same thing on, on, as before. I can now take the probability that x bar is greater than 54 is equal to the probability that z is greater than 2.40. And we get the idea now. We can just write down this is equal to 0 0.0, 0 
0, 8, 2. Again, I was doing the same thing, 1 minus the probability. Skip that I step there, I'll write it up. <clears throat> so again, doing essentially the same thing that we've done before, but again, we have a different z-score. It's kind of the, the main difference here. So let's let's think about what changed what changed in each one of these in each one of these parts. So um, we had our sample size up here, and we had the probability that the sample mean was was greater than fifty four. So the the first the first thing we considered was when we had just one just one one uh, dog that we were looking at, um, and so we can the average of one is the same as just looking at that observation by itself. And then we had four dogs in our sample, and then we had 16. And what happened to the probability? So it started out being 0.2743. Then it dropped down to 0.1151. And then that last one, it was equal to 0.0082. So our probabilities there are getting are getting smaller, right? As we as our n gets bigger, the probabilities are getting getting smaller. Why why is that why is that the case? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else? Well, because the blood that they got it into the like, normal part, there's um, like there would be more values like inside of the closer to the Yeah, okay. Ex exactly right. Exactly right. So the response was that um, as our sample gets bigger, as n gets bigger, the standard deviation gets smaller. And so remember what the standard deviation tells us how spread out the normal distribution is. So if, if the standard deviation is getting smaller, that means it's getting more and more, more, and more scrunched together. Um, so ignore the top of that real quick. And so our, our normal distribution goes from being kind of, kind of flat and spread out um, to, to something that's much more much more peaked. So as the standard deviation gets smaller, that gets scrunched in there. And so if I'm interested in if I'm interested in 54 here, that's just like 54 here. So if here's if, there, if my mean is in the middle there, 52.5, um, you can see that the, that as it gets as it gets more and more scrunched in, uh, more and more of the values are going to be inside that 54 that we were looking at. Sorry, that's really small. <laughs> so that's kind of that's kind of the picture you can keep in your mind as as we're as we're looking at this. And this goes back to that idea that we that we saw earlier that the um, what what did we say? Um, so, so we know that uh, the results of large samples are less variable than the results of small samples. So again, thinking about variability means how squished in or how spread out that distribution is. And so as our sample gets bigger, um, it's going to be less variable. It's going to be more squished in together. So it's kind of hitting that idea that we saw, saw there again. So again, why does this, why does this decrease? Um, and kind of write down what we just said. Um, because the standard deviation is getting smaller and the distribution is kind of more and more squished together. Squished together there. 
Uh, so why, say, say that again, so why am I, like, why am I looking at 54 each time here? Ah, uh, so how, okay. So this is, so, so the question was how is, um, so in each one of these parts we've, we've ha had the average weight of these things be 54. Um, this is kind of like we were looking at before, and we were like, maybe let's go back to, I don't know, the little brown bat example we had. We were thinking about what what pro what percentage or what's the probability that the wingspan is is greater than 25 or whatever the number was. So it's just saying suppose suppose I took an average, suppose I took 16 dogs here or four or whatever I am. What's the probability that their weight would be would be 54 or or more? So I, I haven't actually taken a sample. I haven't actually calculated an average here. I'm just saying, if I did, what's the probability that the average from that group would be 54 or bigger? So X bar is always still the observed value. Exactly right. Um, it's still what we would calculate from our sample. Um, this is sort of thinking about. Well, we haven't actually collected any samples, but if we did, what would this what would this probability be? Does that does that make sense? Okay. Good question. Any other question you guys can think of on notation or what, I, what I'm talking about here? Okay. Well, this leads us to uh, one of the more one of the more tricky things in this entire class, I think, something called the the center limit theorem. So, in that example we just discussed, uh, if you look at the statement of the example, it says that um, again the distribution of adult male English Springer Spaniel weights is approximately normal. So there, there, our population distribution was was normal. Um, so what if we have what if we have a different case here? What if the population distribution is is not normal, or what if we don't know what don't know what it is? Um, and then the a little quote from the authors here is that it's a remarkable fact that as the sample size gets bigger, the distribution of the sample mean changes shape, um, and it becomes more and more normal. And so this is again regardless of what the original population is. So this this leads us to the idea of the of the central limit theorem. So before before we had uh, we had this a similar statement up here, but we said something about the distribution of of x. So before x had a normal distribution, um, now we can say the same uh, a, ver a very similar thing. So if we take a simple random sample of size n from any population, from any population. Um, that has mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Uh, what this central limit theorem says is that when when n is large, when our sample is big enough, um, the sampling distribution of the sampling mean is approximately what we saw before. So we can still we can use all the same things that we that we used before, as long as our sample is is big enough. So here, um, x can have can have any distribution and still x bar is is approximately normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma over the square root of n when n is large Yeah. How do we know if n is considered large? Ah, fantastic question. How do we know if n is considered large? Uh, that's a very good question. That's going to be the next slide. <laughs> so just get, before we before we move on to that again, just remembering that just like just like before, um, we can use the same ideas without assuming that the that x has a normal distribution to start with. So the question, uh, yes, so, so this allows us to answer the same kind of questions even if we haven't assumed that, like in the previous example, that that distribution of weights was, was normal. So yes, my question, how large is large enough? What do you, what do you guys think? How, how large does, does large need to be? 
Five? A thousand? <laughs> Two hundred? Ten thousand? <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a very satisfying answer here. It depends. <laughs> Um, and it sort of depends on what the population distribution is. Um, but for this class, um, we will consider large enough large enough to be um, a sample size of at least of at least 40. I don't know. Does 40 sound like a big number to you? I don't know, but uh, that's what we're going to use for the purposes of this class. So as long as our sample size that we that we take is 40, we can use that that uh, approximation on the on the previous on the two slides previous to that. I'm sorry, I just saw a question coming in on the back channel. It says, are all the homeworks three and four posted? Homeworks three should all be posted. Those should be back in your hands. Handed back last week. Homeworks four are actually probably not posted yet. So if you have a zero, I've gotten a few emails about that. Um, you don't actually have a zero. It's just that grade hasn't been posted yet. OK, so uh, this, this leads us to um, Kind of what we're going to use moving forward here is that we, we're going to have some conditions to check. So we can we can use this method if if a few things hold. So um, in order to use that central limit theorem again, let's let's jump back to the statement of that. Um, there's there's uh, three criterion that we have on here. Let's see if we can pick them out. Well, actually, I guess there's just two. But so what we need is that we need a simple random sample, and we need we need n to be large. So those are our first two sort of criterion that we need there to be able to use this to be able to use this result and so that's that's what I've listed here so so I need I need I need to check three things here I'm gonna throw one more at you to check before I can use the central limit theorem the first one is do I have a random sample so um, in some way or another is it a random sample randomized experiment anything like that or or if it's if you're not told it's a random sample is it a representative sample of the population. So that's kind of the, the most important thing is do I have a good do I have a good sample? So that's gonna be our, our random sample condition. Secondly or and then and then lastly is is our sample size n at least forty. That's the other thing that we that we looked at that's kind of in the statement of the theorem. The one other thing that we're going to need to check is we want to make sure our sample isn't too big. So we want our sample to be big enough but not but not too big. Um, it's kind of like the Goldilocks principle, right? I don't want it to be too big or too small. I want it to be just just right. <laughs> and so I'm going to check that is uh, is my sample is is the population at least 20 times bigger than my sample, or is my sample less than five percent of the population? So I don't want to. I don't want to have too many, too too much of my of my population in my in my sample. I want to make sure my population is is big enough. So these are the three conditions we're going to need to check before we can before we can apply that uh, this this result. So before we move on to the example, I'm going to take take a quick detour from your notes and go back to that example that we that I looked at at the beginning of this of this class. So again, I'm going back to this, this situation where these 400 students are my population. Same setup. I've collected information on them. I made a histogram of their, of their heights. So I have um, these are the individual values, and I kind of have this bimodal shape going on here. Um, and again, we can note that this we didn't we didn't comment on this, but we can. I mean, this is definitely not normal, right? The the di the distribution here is not looking like it's, it's very normal. It's bimodal, it's maybe a little skewed, it's not completely symmetric, all of these things that are sort of violating the fact that it's, that it's normal. Um, 
But so what I can do is, is kind of like, like I did before, I took a sample of five, but let's first, if I took just a sample of, of two people, simple random samples of two people from my population, um, do that a thousand times, find what their average is and make a histogram, I get that, that shape over there on the, on the far uh, right. So it's kind of, kind of the same picture that we saw before, now I only have two people in my, in my sample. Here's the picture that I did show you before is if I take samples of size five from my, from my population, um, I, I find average of each one of those samples and I can make a histogram. That's the picture that we saw, that we saw before. Um, and so lastly here, if I take samples of size 60, so I first I took samples of size two, then five. Now if I jump all the way up to 60, um, if I take a thousand of those samples, and uh, make an average height, then the histogram looks, looks like this. And so just to, just to show you that we went from something that was our, popu our, our population distribution. Was not normal. It's definitely not normal, right? It was that bimodal shape that we were seeing. Um, but uh, this picture kind of reiterates what, uh, what the central limit theorem shows you. So if I, if I think about kind of making a smooth curve to these things, as my sample size gets bigger, it looks, the, the histogram I get looks more and more like a normal distribution. Um, and so these are, all, these are all sampling distributions down here. So here n equals 2, n equals 5, and n equals 60. So this picture is I'm um, trying to trying to just show you what I mean by the central limit theorem is that whatever my whatever my population distribution is here, it's something that's bimodal and kind of weird. Um, my sampling distribution as I, as my sample size increases starts to look more and more like a normal distribution. So this is where your minds explode because that's really crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So if we were if we were checking this in class, um, you'd note that I need my sample to be at least 40 to actually use this thing. Um, and so yes, yeah, so we would only want to use it in that last case. Um, good, good observation. So yes, that's another good observation. So 60 is more than 5% of my sample, so I wouldn't want to actually use that here either. But um, so maybe a bad example here, I guess. Um, but uh, the point is that the, sh the shape, the shape is kind of what we're trying to look at here. Yeah, just to note that it is starting to look pretty, pretty normal there. Kind of have that that bell bell shape that we're we've been looking looking for all along. All right, so main, main idea is we just need to remember that we need to check our conditions before we can use these calculations. I was just trying to show you kind of what this, what it looks like, kind of give you a visual argument for why this is happening. So let's, let's indeed take a look at an example here. Um, here we're looking at uh, ACT scores. So um, I have 1.6 million people took the ACT in, back in 2011. How many of you guys took the ACT? Maybe uh, SAT, and SAT people in here. Oh, okay, both. Put both in. <laughs> both in. <hands>? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess Ohio is an ACT state, right? Uh, I went to a college in Virginia, which is an SAT state. Anyway, um, let's assume now that the average composite score for these students was 21.1, something we pulled down from the from the website there, and that the standard deviation of those 1.6 million people was 4.7. So what was the, what's the probability that a random sample of 50 students who took the ACT in 2011 has a mean less than 20? All right, so the first thing to think about is, uh, so I'm looking, at the, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at ACT scores as sort of my variable of interest here. And do they tell me anything about the distribution of ACT scores? Nothing up there, right? We're just told, we're told what, the, well, what the variable is when we're given the mean and the standard deviation. So, um, this is 
mean mu, and this is my standard deviation sigma. But I'm not told anything about what the population distribution is. It could be, could be anything at this point. Um, and so we want to know something about the, um, the mean of a sample of, of 50 people. So that we kind of want to use, use the central limit theorem that we're, we were just talking about. So the first thing we need to do is check our conditions. to make sure that we're allowed to use these, these calculations here. Um, so my, my three conditions, again, I have, I have three of them are, do I have a random sample? Um, is it small enough? And is it, is it large enough? So my first, my first question here is, is, do I have a random sample? So I'm, I'm looking at this, this group of 50 people. Do I have a random sample? Everybody said, duh. <laughs> yes, I do, right? It's, um, it is stated in the problem. So we're told we have a random sample of 50 people. So that we're, we're OK there. Um, is my sample large enough? Is, is 50 people? Uh, 5%, less than 5% of my sample, Ab absolutely. So I can take 50, how we can write this down is I want to make sure my, my population is at least 20 times bigger than my sample. So if I take my sample size times 20, um, and that is less than 1.6 million by just, by just a little bit. So my, my, my whole population is 1.6 million students who have taken this test. Um, and my sample is less than less than five percent of that. And then my my sample size is n equals fifty. Is that big enough? Well, is it is it greater than forty? Well, on most days, fifty is bigger than forty. So we can uh, we can put three check marks over here, and we're uh, we're all set. We can use we can use the central limit theorem now to um, find this find this to answer this question. Oh, I don't have very much space, do I? So what I want to do down here is following. So again, I can take, I can take my, find my z-score, take my x-bar that I'm interested in minus the mean divided by sigma over the square root of n. And this is, uh, I haven't drawn the picture, have I? What I want is the probability that this sample has a mean less than 20. So I'm interested in, in 20. Subtracting off the mean, which is 21.1, dividing by 4.7, divided by the square root of 20, uh, 50. And if I calculate my z-score here, that is going to be uh, negative 1.65. And uh, and then so what I what I want what I want to know here is if if um, well sorry I'm running a little running out of space here a little bit if I say x bar is the average ACT of these 50 people 50 students I want the probability that x bar is less than 20 which equals the probability that z is less than negative 1.65. And I can go back to my table A and find the usual thing. And this is going to be 0 0.4095. 0 So there, there's my answer. If I want the probability that this random sample of 50 students has an ACT score of less than 20, I can standardize, find my z-score. That's the same as the probability that z is less than uh, negative 1.65, which is about 5%, 0 0.0495. So Sorry, it's a little scrunched on there. But is, is that OK, what we're doing here? So we did the same thing that we did before. Um, we just filled in the gaps by, by now. We don't have to assume that the that the original distribution is is normal, which which should should feel good to you guys. Uh, again, um, 
the assumption that something has a normal distribution is kind of a strong assumption. So what if, what if that's not actually true? Well, we can, still, we can still answer a question like this even if that distribution isn't, isn't really normal. So let's do, I think I have time for, for one more example here at least. Um, same, same idea here. The distribution of, of uh, 20 year old men's weights has mean 155 and standard deviation 22. And the distribution is, is right skewed. So now suppose we take a random sample of 120 year old men and we find their weights. Uh, what's the probability that the, their average weight will be between 152 and 160? So same, same situation here. We can't, we can't use our original idea because um, we are told that the distribution is, is right skewed here. So again, our, our population distribution is, is not normal. Uh, but that's okay. We can, we can uh, use the same strategy that we used before. So again, first thing we want to do is, is check our conditions. And just beware, you guys are going to get very tired of checking conditions, but we <laughs> always need to make sure to do that. So we have our three conditions, um, random sample, um, small enough, So again, obviously, do we have a random sample? Yes, why? <laughs> it says so, right? So yes, we do have a random sample. And it's stated, stated in the problem. So just make, make that distinction that we, why we can say that it's random. Um, is it small enough? Well, we have, um, we have 100 people. So is 100 times 20, which is 2,000. Uh, is that is that less than than uh, all the the total number of twenty year old twenty year old men? Oh no, that's bad. Thank you. <laughs> I meant to plug this in a long time ago. Ooh, close one. Go away. Excellent. <laughs> so, are there at least twenty two thousand men that are twenty years old? Obviously, right? So yeah, so this is, there's that many at Ohio State. So this is less than uh, all 20, all 20 year old men. So we're, we're okay there. And you know, I have a large enough sample. Again, N equals 100, which again is greater than 40. So we can check, check, and check. We're all, all good to go for these, these three conditions. Okay, I do have I do have a new slide here. That's good. So let me let me draw the picture here now, just to um, well we we don't we can't write down the 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 distribution of what our x is, but because these three conditions have checked out, uh, we can assume that our sample mean x bar is going to have approximately this normal shape anyway. So we're centered here at uh, one fifty five. We want to know something about z. And we want to know something, uh, what percentage of these people are between 152 and 160. So we want to find what that shaded in area is. Again, my, my z's are going to be 152 minus 155 divided by um, 22 divided by the square root of 100. Let me rush through this here, 1.36. And my other z is going to be 160 minus 155 divided by 22 over 100, which is 2.27. Fill that in down on my z chart here, 1.36, center at 0, 2.27. So then the probability that, that x bar is between 152 and 160 is the same as the probability of z being between 1.3 negative 1.36 and 
and 2.27. And you guys know how to do this now, so I'll just tell you that the answer is um, 0 0.9015. So again, uh, once I get to here, once I get to this bottom part of the page, it's just like what we've been doing before. Um, you can use your favorite strategy to figure out what that shaded in area there is. Um, the different thing up here is just that we're changing what our z-score is and we have, to make sure, we have to check some conditions to make sure we're actually allowed to do this. So I'm out of time. I think we're almost at the end of the chapter. Um, have a great rest of the day, you guys, and we'll, uh, we'll see you on Friday. Hey. My, uh, <clears throat> this homework.